Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks to Wolfram J for the invitation. Um, great meeting, and uh, it's also thanks to Miguel for introducing lymphatics and doing the embryonic development side. I, uh, my title was Cardiac Lymphatic System, which means I could have told you about anything to do with this uh, vascular bed, but I've chosen to tell you an unpublished study uh, in terms of development, this postnatal development, but in terms of the, uh, what the lymphatics are doing during uh, mouse neonatal heart regeneration, or more importantly, what they're not doing. So I think we've heard a lot of this meeting of some very exciting findings um, sort of directed at ways to develop new muscle and, and of course new blood vessels. I think less so uh, we, has featured the, the need to condition the local environment, this whole idea about reducing fibrosis and inflammation and of course it's a very cytotoxic mix in terms of restoring new tissue and of course in terms of cell therapy and gene therapy, et cetera, et cetera. So we've sort of thought about this from the perspective of the lymphatic system and the reason for that is in addition to canonical roles in tissue fluid balance, immune surveillance, absorption of dietary lipids, et cetera, et cetera, steady state. If you have a, a, a sites of injury and inflammation, and this has been best characterized um, peripheral sites and skin injury, there is a, a release of factors by immune cells driving lymphangiogenesis. So there's an increase in lymphatic vessel density coincident with uh, injury and inflammation. We know that uh, immune cells are trafficked into these lymphatic vessels, and this is really important process of the wound healing. And that if you block some of these factors, VEGFC and D, this will delay the immune clearance, and that is by uh, decreasing the lymphatic network, et cetera. Whereas um, delivery of these factors will increase the network and overall, this improves tissue repair. So this has all been very nicely characterized by Carrie Alatello and others in the context of sort of skin and dermal wound healing. And we were interested in what this might look like in the heart. And uh, this just summarizes a whole bunch of work just by way of background. But if you look at a, a, a myocardial infarction, so if you look in the adult heart prior to any injury, then we have these epicardial lymphatic vessels, as um, was described. Uh, by Miguel in terms of development, but these persist, of course, through adulthood. And then we also have some that in the underlying regions, of the epicardium into the myocardium. If you take after injury, there is a massive remodeling of these and increase in density. And if you take this out further, you see these huge lymphatic shunts, which uh, are, is, a, is a very pronounced remodeling effect in some sort of compensatory mechanism. Then what we showed is if you can augment this further by adding uh, VEGFC, or in this case, the, the, the C156S mutated form that only signals through VEGF receptor 3 just to target the lymphatics. If you do that, you get a reduced immune cell loading in the heart. We're able to show that that is due to trafficking to the draining mediastinal lymph nodes, and all of this contributes to a very significant preservation of uh, function through all of the usual MRI parameters uh, in the mouse. And this is all gain of function. In addition to this, we're able to show in a knockout model of Live 1, so a global knockout of Live 1 with David Jackson, that is absolutely essential for the ingression of immune cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, etc., and trafficking, that if you have a loss of Live 1, this leads to uh, functional impairment and uh, increased fibrosis and remodeling, and that's because there's a failure to traffic out these immune cells. So what we suggested from all of this work, then, is that there is a clear therapeutic opportunity around the loading of the immune cells in the heart that reflects an optimal for wound healing. And uh, we've continued to follow this up by trying to understand what it is we've cleared in terms of these immune cells, in terms of their transcriptional profiles and their cytokine profiles and functionality in relation to what's in the lymph nodes and what's in the heart that correlates with this outcome. But along the way, we were very interested to try and understand, well, what might they be doing elsewhere at different time points, different injury models, and in, and in particular in the context of regeneration in the neonatal heart, uh, heart mouse model, which of course was first described very beautifully by Enzo Perello uh, over a decade ago now. And this is really driven by the fact that we know from Eric Olson's work back in 20, 2014 that, that tissue resident macrophages are essential for this regenerative response in the neonatal mouse heart. So what Eric showed with clodinate liposome depletion of these tissue resident macrophages, that the, uh, p the P1 mouse, the mouse that normally would re regenerate immediately after birth, fails to regenerate, and Eric showed that this was due in part through angiogenic factors that these macrophages produce, so increase the vascularization and so on, and that was all blocked. So the hypothesis was fairly simple. Cardiac lymphatics will probably not respond at P1 because they don't need to clear what a pro-regenerative macrophage is. Whereas if we 
look later on, of course, they will clear the pro-fibrotic macrophages at the P7 stage, as we see in adult hearts. So initially, this required some, some uh, imaging and quantification, and this is work done by Costas Klarakis, who's a, P a Wellcome Trust PhD student. And he had some light sheet imaging here. You can see the, the, the vascular plexus on the epicardial surface, or just underlying, um, which is very nice. And you can able to quantify this. And of course, just standard uh, whole mount uh, staining with then some quantification tools around image J and angio tool, but at least to give us an, an idea of how we quantify this response and also what's happening during these postnatal stages. And what's very evident is there is a massive expansion in the lymphatic plexus. And of course, this just occurs simply with growth, but it's also the complexity of the plexus. And you can quantify that here through parameters such as vessel length, vessel caliber, junction points, endpoints, et cetera, et cetera. So there is, with growth, as you predict, there's a very marked response postnatally. So it's not that these are finished at birth. And we see, uh, obviously, uplift in all of the usual genes that you would expect to see over this time course. Also an interesting sort of drop and then peak again happening around this day 14 which, if I recall correctly, was an interesting time point in which a, a burst of proliferative cardiomyocyte activity was also described. But anyway, there is this clear gene expression trend. So we wanted to look in the injury setting, and of course we used the myocardial infarction coronary artery ligation model in the neonate. And you can see very bluntly that at P1 versus P7, and this is just a few days after injury, you can see from this staining for VEGFR3 here, these lymphatics, there is a marked pronounced response uh, in the P7 animal that you don't see in the P1. And you can see that here, shown again, and this time with some quantification. Here's the P1 response shown in around the injury site, and this is, you can see the suture still is here, so this is permanent ligation compared to the P7 response. So it looks like this lymphangiogenic response that we see in the adult happens at P7, but it doesn't happen at P1, coincidence with this loss of regeneration during this regenerative window. Interestingly enough, though, that lymphangiogenic response is background dependent. So again, I think you know, this is a, a good take-home message of caution about looking at different genetic backgrounds, and we know this is true for uh, Henry Sukoff's work in terms of the mononuclear versus binuclear versus polyploid cardiomyocytes. We know it's true for other aspects of heart um, sort of performance after injury and in stress, but it's true here also the lymphatics. So whereas we see in black six animals, the result I showed you previously, this very limited, if, it's, if any, response to injury, we look in CD1, 129 mice, we see a very pronounced response. So if there is a response and it's lymphangiogenesis, then are they competent to transfer or not immune cells? So to, to test that, we took um, CD68 EGFP adult donor mice. So this will label all monocyte macrophages. Took the spleens as we'd done previously in adoptive transfer experiments from adult to adult to show trafficking. And we know these are competent to be trafficked in the adult situation put them into uh, P1 or P7 recipient pups after MI, and one week later, we looked in the hearts, and we also collected the mediastinal lymph nodes. And I'll just to say, if you're thinking about trying to find mediastinal lymph nodes in a P1 animal, don't. It's ridiculously hard. And uh, this is something that cost us, I mean, I didn't even know they, they had any. Quite frankly, we had no idea if they even had draining lymph nodes at this early stage. But they do, and he, not only was he able to isolate them, he was able to look at them histologically. And you can see here, in terms of the trafficking, if we look here at P1, seven days after injury, and what you're seeing here is CD68 staining, so this will pick up the resident macrophages that are in the lymph nodes. It's important to note there are resident macrophages here, but you see very few, if any, of the donor uh, macrophages. Whereas we look at P7, after, again, seven days after injury, here you can clearly see a very pronounced population of these traffic, which must have come from the donor uh, animals and have come from the heart. So these are traffic to the draining lymph nodes. It doesn't occur at P1. Again, looking more um, carefully at this, again, at P1, here's the intact, and there's the injury setting. So we have a few that are traffic, but significantly um, less compared to the uh, P7 situation. You can quantify that, comparing at the comparative stage of the intact animal. So there is an increase in the number overall, but in terms of the trafficking, this is much more significant at P7 and doesn't really occur to any great degree in the P1 mouse. So what's happening? Why is that, why is that happening? Well, there's one interesting developmental or postnatal development uh, thing that can occur is this shift in the uh, junction um, structure and formation between the lymphatic and epithelial cells. So they can move through in different lymphatic beds. So here I'm showing the diaphragm and trachea, and this is um, work uh, 
published by Ronald McDonald back in 2012 now, showing some very nice images showing how they move from a zipper to a button junction uh, um, structure. And that happens both in the diaphragm and trachea, and you can see how over time there is this move, reduction of the zippers and move to more, more button-like structures. And what does that mean? That, that's a change from permeability, so it's a change from impermeable zippers down to permeable buttons. So Costas looked in the cardiac lymphatics to see if a similar transition is occurring over that window of time, P1 to P7, and indeed that's exactly what he saw. We have these zipper more cell impermeable, so there is no way that the ingression of the macrophages can necessarily occur, or if it does, it's at very low level, as I've already shown. Whereas at P7, these are much more permeable, and this is the adult phenotype for this uptake. But of course, it's not just structural. There are also important uh, signaling events occurring here, and we did a, a large-scale RNA, single-cell RNA-seq experiment where we've taken hearts, spleen, bone marrow, and blood, looking very primarily focused around the immune cells, but also, of course, able to capture uh, cardiac lymphatic and the field cells and other cell types. And we've done that at P1 and P7 at different time points after injury. And this just summarizes a whole, a whole bunch of data, but I'm just going to make the point that obviously there's a lot of signaling that occurs between lymphatic endothelial and macrophages in both directions. And that some of the interesting observations, differences between P1 after injury and P7 after injury, uh, shown here, here's osteopontin. Here's a putative signaling pathway at P7 that is upregulated, macrophages, so integrin beta 1, relin, P7 between the lymphatic endothelial cells and the macrophages. So some of these pathways now we're just starting to follow up from the molecular standpoint. Because clearly there is some ability to traffic, but there's some changes in the signaling between these two cell types that reflects this loss through to P, um, uh, from P1 occurring then at P7. One pathway that we're very familiar with though, that we, as I mentioned at the beginning, is this live one pathway. So that we know that macrophages and dendritic cells produce hyaluronic acid Live one on the surface of the lymphatic endothelium is the receptor for hyaluronic acid. So this signaling pathway is essential for, again, for these uh, immune cells to ingress and move into and then are trafficking accordingly. And what happens is the pre presentation of HA on the lymphatic endothelium expressing live one, the binding causes receptor clustering, which causes the lymphatic endothelium to pull apart, leaving a space for this cell to crawl into and then be trafficked accordingly. So our hypothesis here then was in a live one loss of function background, if pro-root generative macrophage are not required to be cleared at P1, then live one loss of function should have no effect on the heart in terms of function and, and regeneration and so on because they're not, they don't need to be cleared and I've shown you there's a, a, a lack of clearance at this stage, so live one should have no effect. Of course, like all good hypotheses, it's completely wrong. Um, what actually we found was at P1 there was a reduced function, and there's other aspects I'm not going to have time to show you here, so significantly reduced function at P1 in this global LIVE1 loss of function background. So LIVE1 is not just expressed in the lymphatic endothelium as shown here, but also in these tissue resident macrophages, and this is somewhat overlooked in terms of the sort of literature on LIVE1 and, and its potential role, and there's no known function for it outside of the lymphatics. So that suggests to us then that there's a possibility that LIVE1 is functioning in these tissue resident macrophages in the context of uh, signaling or in the context of some other aspect that is unknown in terms of ensuring this regenerative response. Because as I said, in the global knockout, we see this failed regeneration and we see this impaired function. So we've now got these um, live one flox mice, which David Jackson just had generated from Genoa. So these are not published and they're not widely available yet. And we're just studying these against uh, another mouse model that David Greaves has generated, which is this human C68 inducible CRE. So this will enable us to target just the tissue resident macrophage population at these time points and start to te try and tease out what's happening with the live one function in this context. And I think this will be a very interesting further avenue of study and hopefully I can come back and tell you the results of that in, in the future. So just to thank everybody uh, that's done the work, as I say, this was really driven by Costas, a Wellcome Trust PhD student with, with help from Carla and the surgeries and, and others doing surgery and overseen by Joaquin Vieira, and then help with the MRI, particularly challenging doing neonatal MRI after a, a short time frame after injury, the very small hearts and a whole different algorithm to do the scanning. Um, mouse models from David Jackson, David Greaves, and some uh, collaborative input from, uh, from colleagues in cardiovascular medicine, and of course, the funding agencies. Thank you very much.